Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you again. We are starting a brand new series called Church, What's Next? You'll have picked up by now that we're making some changes to our Sunday services as the COVID restrictions start to ease. Now, there were a number of ways we could have gone with this and we did our best to get feedback and try and understand how people are feeling about in-person church again. You know, as we talked and we prayed with our life group leaders just before Easter, our, our overwhelming conviction was that whatever we do, we must prioritise first and foremost for our young people. With everything that's going on, we have a limited amount of capacity and resources to use on gathering together safely. And we want to kind of spend that energy wisely. You know, our youth and kids have really missed out over lockdown and we want to do whatever we can to help them get into the habit of coming back to church, of seeing their friends, of gathering, worshipping, learning and having fun together. We believe that young people are very precious to God and they're a priority for him. And so we've gone with that plan. And this morning I want to explore that theme just a little bit more as I ask the question, what does it look like to put our young people first as we move out of lockdown? So much has changed over the last year. We've all had a lot to adapt to. But as a church, our main objective hasn't changed. We exist to help people connect with Jesus and become his disciples together. And while we've been forced to gather and do things very differently, gather in different ways, we're still in the business of helping people of all ages to connect with Jesus. Now, practically, we're just not 100% sure how the next few months are going to go. We don't know exactly what our new normal will end up looking like. We don't know when everyone will feel safe. We don't know when we'll be able to sit together inside the building without wearing masks and when we'll be able to sing together in our worship space. But as we do take some tentative steps towards unlocking, we have a strong conviction that there are certain things that we must prioritise in this season. These are things that have always been important to us but are coming into focus right now. And so we're going to explore those over the next three or four weeks, starting, as I said, today, as we think about what Jesus is saying about our young people. Let's um, look at these uh, verses. There's two passages I want to look at this morning. One's in Matthew 18. It's a well-known passage, but we're going to read it together. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and he placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. There's another passage just in the next chapter, short, another short passage, Matthew 19, chapter, uh, verses 13 to 15. It says, then the people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Children are hardly mentioned in the Gospels. They didn't really feature that much in public society, but here Jesus makes an incredible public physical statement about their value. He places them at the front and centre of this group and this crowd, showing just how precious they are to God. How any society treats their children reflects how they understand and see God and the world and ultimately themselves. You know, many societies in the ancient world treated their children appallingly, almost less than human, at least until they'd reached puberty, if they even made it that far. That was a widely pervasive attitude. In fact, some languages, including the Greek language in which the New Testament was first written, in those languages, the word for child is neither masculine nor feminine. It's just a, a neutral word. It's an it. Not a he or a she, but an it. That's the case with the word in that original passage. But Hebrew society wasn't quite like the pagan nations around it. And we can read several places in the Old Testament where children are included in the Jewish community. Although they weren't treated violently, in the time of Jesus, children were mostly ignored in public, generally seen as inconsequential, a little bit inconvenient, and a bit of a nuisance. And that's certainly what the disciples seem to think in that second passage as they tried to shoo these children away from Jesus. But Jesus wouldn't have it. I love this scene from the internet drama The Chosen. Um, it's a brilliant series about the life of Jesus. It's an imagined scene where Jesus is spending time with these children in Galilee. But significantly, it takes place before Jesus has really made himself known 
to the grown-ups before he's really come out into public with his ministry. So he so values the children that he makes time for them first. And although it's imagined, it's entirely in keeping with the Jesus that we read about in the Gospels, which is why it works so well. And by the way, if you haven't seen The Chosen, I highly recommend it. For me, it's simply the best, most authentic portrayal I've ever seen of Jesus. It's available online and you should check it out. You do have to give it two or three episodes uh, before to set things up before it really gets going, but it's so worth it. Anyway, going back to these passages in Matthew, Jesus is teaching the disciples a really important lesson about God's kingdom, about God's way of doing things. It won't be about the survival of the fittest or the loudest or the angriest or the most successful, Jesus is saying. Think about the weakest, most vulnerable, least significant human being you can think of. This is the one who God values as precious. This is symbolic of what God's kingdom will be like. It's so typical of Jesus to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. Throughout his whole ministry, he made a point of valuing those whose society generally cast aside women, lepers, tax collectors, shepherds, prostitutes, the poor, the marginalized. The context of this conversation is the disciples arguing about who is better than the other. I mean, it sounds immature and laughable, and it probably was. This was a male-dominated and somewhat macho culture. And instead of playing into that or even kicking off against it, Jesus just does something simple and unexpected to create this beautiful, symbolic memory moment. It's like Jesus is saying, never mind your insecurities and your silly comparisons. Have a look at God's perspective. Here, look at this child. Here is your example to follow. Little children are by nature weak, vulnerable, dependent, innocent, trusting and uncertain. These are the qualities, Jesus says, which all of us need to relate to God. Now that in itself is a challenge for those of us who want to follow Jesus. But that's a whole other talk. Again, in this second passage, Jesus is very clear with his disciples, the ones who are trying to stop the children coming to him. He says, let the children come. Do not hinder them. The kingdom of heaven belongs to these. I have always understood this to mean don't get in the way of helping children relate to Jesus. In fact, do everything you can to help them. They are precious to him and they are so worth investing in. If you ask a group of believers at what they came to faith, you will generally find that two-thirds of them chose to follow Jesus before the age of 18. Normally, if we were in the room, I'd ask for a show of hands, but I can't do that. But I'd be interested to know. So maybe if that's you, put a comment in the chat. If you chose, to be, to be honest, whenever you chose to follow Jesus, that's wonderful. But I'm just interested. If you happen to choose before you were 18, I'd love to know. Just put a comment in the chat. Even if you think purely in terms of cold, hard evangelism, then the facts suggest that investing in young people is really important. But our vision goes so much further and deeper than that. These are God's precious people who he loves and values and has so much time for. This is something that Joe and I very much took to heart in our previous life before we moved to Winchester 10 years ago. As a newly married couple back in 1995, we were challenged to spend at least the next five years of our lives investing in young people. And so we did. Not only did I work as a primary school teacher, but together in our spare time, we took over leading the children's ministry in our church. We actually spent the next 14 years in that role, training and managing volunteer teams, creating teaching plans and material, organizing holiday clubs and youth residentials, writing and producing children's worship songs. We had the privilege of seeing a whole generation of children grow up through our church and knowing them. And now it's amazing, through the power of social media, we get to see some of the amazing things they're doing as grown-ups as they follow Jesus with a living and vibrant faith. Now, during all those years, as you can imagine, we had some great times and we had some tough times too. We were meeting in rented spaces for about 12 years where we had to clear the furniture, clean the floors, set out the equipment every Sunday morning, pack it away at the end every week. Some seasons we hardly had any team and we didn't make it into a church service for weeks. Sometimes we were exhausted, we were running out of ideas and lacking motivation to go on. But we just knew ultimately that God had called us to this and that these young people were very precious to him and that we had an important job to do. We considered it our role to make sure that they knew that they were special and they were loved by God and they could meet with him anytime. And it was so worth the investment. 
The last year of COVID has been a really tough time for all of us, hasn't it? But I think it's been particularly tough for our children. Educationally, it's been disruptive, but socially, it's been really tricky. Here's a quote from a recent report on young people's mental health. It said this, many children and young people have likely experienced loneliness during lockdown and in particular have been affected by a lack of physical contact with their friends, families and peers and the boredom and frustration associated with the loss of all the activities they've been used to taking part in. Our children have missed seeing their wider family and their friends at school and their clubs and activities and at the church. And so as soon as we can here at Winchester Vineyard, we want to do something about that. What we really want to do is run our Sunday children's groups again, but right now there are two key obstacles to overcome. One is the social distancing rules and the other is the team. One we have to wait for, the other we can do something about. On social distancing, the current rules severely restrict the kind of interaction which children can have if they gather in a room, such that if we're not careful, we feel that our teams will probably just be policing them the whole time and telling them off for getting too close. And we just don't think that will make for much fun for anybody really and we can't do much about those rules right now but we are sure that they will relax at some point in the next few months so one of our key aims is to be ready to start our young people's groups again when it becomes viable we don't know if that will be this side of the summer or later in the autumn but we do really want to be prepared well prepared to welcome our young people back to church when we can and to do that we're going to need a team and right now we just don't have one We're going to need a whole bunch of people to get involved. Now, you might have been on a kids team before and maybe you're ready to jump back in. Brilliant. We'd love to hear from you. You might have never been on a kids team. You might not feel you've got any particular skills in this area, but you would be surprised. We need all kinds of people. You don't have to be a qualified teacher or even a parent. We just need those who can chat to children, who can facilitate games, who can help with activities, who can quietly get on with practical preparation. You don't have to be extrovert or outgoing. You just have to love Jesus and care about his kids and be prepared to get stuck in. Stephen and Louise have done an absolutely amazing job over the last year, sourcing, creating and uploading content for children and families to engage with, worship, stories, activities, car park church. They've had some great support from some of the existing team members, but this is a new season and it's going to need a new energy and it's going to need a bigger capacity and we're going to need more people. So if you're part of this church, I want to invite you seriously and prayerfully to consider if the Lord might be asking you to get more involved with helping our young people come back to church. If the answer is yes, then please be in touch with us. Contact Stephen and Louise or send an email to the office and we'll forward your details. Now, we know that our teenagers have also struggled in this time. That ironically, although they are supposed to be the digital generation, they've had a hard time engaging with church activities online and have really missed hanging out and worshipping and just being together in person. Now, we've got some great youth life groups going on Zoom, but we were so delighted the other week when they could gather in the car park around some fire pits. And we're excited that they're going to continue to do that regularly on Friday nights, hopefully in the next season. In fact, we're in the process of constructing a shelter to make it easier. Here's a little picture of it under construction. Uh, that's going to be our, youth, our new outdoor youth space uh, for gathering uh, in COVID-free <laughs> secure times. Um, and again, we would love you to consider getting involved with our young people. They need encouragers. They need role models. They need supporters outside of their own family. You might consider joining the youth team. You'd be welcome. Or you might just consider becoming an, like an adopted godparent to a family with teenagers. If you don't have kids of your own around, but you have some capacity to build relationships with, to encourage, or even just to pray for the next generation, then I can tell you that they will appreciate it, and I know that their parents will. Perhaps you're a grandparent whose own grandchildren live away at a distance. Perhaps you've really missed them in lockdown. Children in the church obviously can't replace your own grandchildren, but maybe you could also be a real blessing to a local family in this season. As we serve and benefit our children, not only will they be blessed, but we will be blessed too. I know that God always blesses our faithful and obedience. And we'll find that we don't just give out, we receive back as well in so many ways. It could be that there's already a family that you know that would fit the bill. Perhaps you could check in and just commit to praying for them on a regular basis. Find out what's going on in their lives and just commit to pray. Stephen's actually looking at a scheme where we partner people up to do this. So again, if this is something that you're interested in, let us know. We could, if you're looking for, um, if, if you could offer this kind of support or if you'd like this kind of support, we'll try and pair people up. 
Um, watch this space for details on that. And I just want to have a word to parents here. Joe and I have tried to speak to as many parents and families as we can over the past few months, and we know that this has been a really challenging season. We know that homeschooling has been intense. Some of you are key workers. Life has been relentless. We know that some of us are worried about how our children or our teenagers are doing. We're deeply concerned about how all of this has impacted them. And we have certainly had some moments over the past year when we've been concerned about our own kids, about their lack of motivation, about the impact of so much screen time, about how their relationships have been affected, and about what impact all of this is having on their faith. Those are very real concerns for parents in this time. And we were on a call with some of the life group leaders and several parents shared this concern and we started to pray. And we really sensed God was with us. And as we were sharing and praying, Adam um, shared something which I thought was really profound and it really spoke to me and I wanted to um, share it with you. He reminded us about the words of the dedication service. You know, when we celebrate the arrival of a new child in church, we give thanks to God for such a precious gift. And the parents make three vows of commitment. They dedicate themselves and the child to God. They promise to bring the child up with the support of family and friends. And they promise to trust God with their child. In fact, here are the words of that third promise. We say, with God's help and the encouragement of the church family, do you promise to set your child an example of faith and love in Jesus? praying regularly for them and trusting that they will come to love God and know his undying love for them, to which the parents respond, we do. So those of us who are parents and have found ourselves anxious about our children in this season, I want to remind us that we have already committed to set them an example by our own faith and love in Jesus, and we can still do that authentically. Despite these challenges, we can commit to pray for them regularly as we did. We can still do that, and we committed to trust that our children would come to know Jesus and his undying love for them in the course of their lives. And that's the commitment we make as parents, and it still holds true. Nothing has changed. We can trust God with our kids. We have to, even in COVID times. None of this was a surprise to him. He has a plan which he is working out. As parents, we are partners in this, but we don't carry the responsibility for our kids alone. In fact, God loves our kids even more than we do. And he has a hold of their lives. And that's the truth, in COVID or not. That's something we can hold on to. He's faithful and we can trust him. And so if you're a parent who struggled with this in the past year, I want to encourage you to keep bringing your kids back to God in prayer. He's well big enough and he's so with them and he's with you as well. And I want to remind all of us about one more bit of that dedication service. Because after the parents have made their vows... The gathered congregation also makes a vow in the form of a prayer to support and encourage the child and their family as they grow. Here are the words we say. We say this together usually. We say, Father God, help us to draw this child into relationship with you by our example and our love. Please help us as we support and encourage them and their family. We ask you to bless them through their whole lives. Now, the Old Testament uses two different words for family. The first one, translated family, is the word bahith which is what we would think of as the immediate family under one roof, where parents are instructed to teach their children the commands of God and to celebrate the stories of what he has done. But the most common word for family in the Old Testament isn't bahith, but mishpokor, which is much more associated with the wider sense of clan, of people bonded together with the common cause, of what we might call community. Now, this would have started with an extended family. A child would grow up, would add on to their parents' house and add more and more generations. But over time, uh, the community would multiply and grow and become a whole tribe. When instructions are given in Deuteronomy for the passing on of the belief system from one generation to the next, they're written in the context of Mishpokor. Every member of this Mishpokor community recognizes their responsibility to communicate the faith of the community to the children of the community. I mean, over time, particular teachers were appointed to train the children, but the emphasis on the whole community having input into the child's life was never lost. And of course, now, whilst the Bahith family looks like our modern nuclear families, Mishpokor looks very much like the church. We're a gathering of multiple generations united together with a common cause and everyone has a responsibility to communicate the faith to the children and youth. And that happens and it's true whether or not we choose to get involved directly. Every member of our church is communicating their faith with the next generation. Whether we're aware of it or not, all of us are passing on to our kids and youth something 
about our attitudes, our passions, our commitments, and the way we worship and the way we respond to others, be they positive or less positive. Whatever is going on, they notice. We were at our house and we had a friend round and he uh, was a friend of ours called Neil. He's a worship leader, actually. Um, and he was just round for tea and uh, it was a bit fraught and frantic. And Joe had to run out to go and take the kids somewhere or do an errand or something. And as Joe went out, it was a cold, dark winter's night. She, um, Neil had parked in front of our drive and Joe didn't quite see. And she accidentally just knocked the car into his car. And she was really a bit, bit flustered and a bit frustrated. She came running back and she said, Neil, I'm so sorry. I think I've just accidentally run into your car. And uh, you wouldn't believe his, his, um, his response. He just said, oh, OK, don't worry about it. Never mind. He didn't even go and look. And Joe was like, no, I'm sure you can come and do something. I don't think I've made much of a mark, but I'm sure I've done something to your car. And he was like, oh, don't worry about it. Honestly, it's fine. And we were talking about it later with our kids. And our kids made the comment. And they, one of our kids said, you can tell he's a worship leader by the way he reacted. They notice. All of us have a part to play in the passing on of our faith to the next generation. And as a church family, we want to make good on our dedication vows. And in this season, we have an opportunity to really be family by placing our young people at the front and center. What does that look like practically? Well, right now, it means that from next Sunday, we're going to be gathering in the car park again every two weeks. It means that our online service is moving to Sunday evenings. Now, that change might be a cost to some of us. But hopefully now you can understand why. We're doing it so we can put our young people first. It means that we've spent money on equipment and resources to make that happen. And on creating that youth space outside. By the way, does anyone have a spare fire pit they can lend us? It means that a whole bunch of us are going to need to be ready to join in our kids and youth teams for when we can gather back into the building. We're hesitant to hold Sunday morning services until we have the people for the teams. We may well need every available volunteer in kids' church. That might mean that if we don't have enough people, that we don't do the coffee rotor and we don't serve coffee because that might be the cost of putting our young people first. Just imagine, though, if we as a community, as a mishpacor, as a church family, decide together that we're going to collectively put our young people first when it comes to coming back to church. Imagine what message that would give to them, what value it would place on them, on their relationships, on their faith, on their future. Now, perhaps for some of us who've already had our vaccines, we're ready to emerge into the world and we want to start seeing our friends again and we have some spare capacity. It might mean in this season that we have the capacity to get involved in supporting or encouraging young people or families. For all of us, it means responding to this word and asking God what he's calling us to do. And as the pastor, I can simply tell you what I think the Lord is inviting us into. I'm not going to force anybody to do anything, but we've just brought it to you. And I humbly invite you to consider your response. We don't know yet all the details and how church is going to look. But I feel like what God is asking for us at this stage is just a heart response. You know, on the day before Easter, we were praying about this. Not the day before Easter. A week or so before Easter, on that day, we were praying about this whole thing. We really sensed that this was God's word to us as a church. And we were contemplating what it might mean and how, should, how we should respond. And then literally one or two days later, we heard from Vineyard Churches that they were hosting an online children's ministry training event. It's actually called It Takes a Village. It's happening on Saturday the 15th of May. It's a one-day conference for anyone who's passionate about seeing the children in our churches and communities ignited with the love of God and released to bring his power like never before. Sounds amazing. There are sessions and seminars for children's leaders in the daytime. And then in the evening, there's a celebration that's open to anyone. Pastors, parents, kids, leaders, grandparents, anyone who longs to leave a lasting legacy in the next generation. And it's funny because this was a conversation we already felt like God was talking to us about. And then we heard about this event and it really resonated with us. Maybe it resonates with you as well. And if not, why not save that date, 15th of May, and book in via the Vineyard Church's website or look out for details that we'll put out just want to finish with some words from Psalm 78. In verse 4 it says this, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. It's all about passing our faith on to the next generation. Um, it goes on in verse 5, He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to tell their children. So the next generation would know them, and even the children yet to be born 
and they in turn would tell their children, then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds and would keep his commands. It's up to us to tell our kids to pass on our faith to the next generation. That's part of what the Bible's talking about. And so I'd just love us to finish this morning um, by praying together that dedication prayer. And the words are here on the screen. And perhaps you can say this with me as we uh, just pray together. Um, obviously, when we normally do this in a dedication, we say it over one particular child. If you've got children in your family or just the children that you know about in the church or just children that you um, are aware of, collectively, why don't we say this prayer together over our next generation as we then listen to God and try and figure out what he wants us to do specifically and how we practically respond. Let's pray. Father God, help us to draw our children and young people into relationship with you by our example and our love. Please help us as we support and encourage them and their families. We ask you to bless them today throughout their whole lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone. It's great to see you. Bless you.